Friends session uh, from a Sutta class. And uh, yesterday, uh, Aya Chanda uh, finished off the second noble truth. And it falls on me to start the third noble truth. And we'll finish off tomorrow by completing the fourth noble truth, maybe. <laughs> and then everybody being light and happy ever after. Who knows? <laughs> Anyway, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. But as usual, I will start with the Namo Tassa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa well, this is the, the third, a noble truth, a noble truth of the cessation of suffering. Yeah. I have enough light in my mind and enough light on the paper. So thank you. So this is a noble truth of the cessation of suffering, uh, Dukkha Niroda. It is a remainderless fading away and cessation of that same wanting referred to in the second noble truth. That is wanting related to the five senses, wanting for existence and wanting not to be. The giving, that's the um, annihilation. The giving up and relinquishing of it, freedom from it, never letting it settle enough to grow. That's the standard definition. Now those four terms, the giving up is the patinisaka. The, uh, that's the patinisaka is the relinquishing of it. Chaga is the giving it up. Freedom from it is muti, and never letting it settle enough to grow, that's analia. And those four words, I remember giving a talk in Australia some years ago on the four ways of letting go, explaining those four terms. And I think that's been downloaded over two million times, that talk. It's one of the most popular talks. And what the giving up means, the chaga, means chaga is like, a generosity, but it's more than generosity. It's giving up, expecting nothing back in return. It's a true giving up. It's where whatever you do, you give, and you don't expect it to go on your record. You gave this or you gave that, and how generous a person you are. It is an act of disappearing, where you give up whatever you have as much as you can, looking after yourself and looking after your responsibilities, and not keeping anything extra. And the Pati Nisaka, the simile which I use for that, that's a relinquishing, was a simile of a hot air balloon. You can imagine you're in the basket of a hot air balloon, and you know, this you rise as rise as high as you possibly can, but you get as far as you can go. And that can be in your spiritual life, in your meditation. So what do you do? You use your wisdom to see what else you can throw out of the basket. You know, you're the ballast. And when you throw all the ballast out, you go very high, but then you look for something else to throw out. And anything possible you throw out of the balloon, you rel relinquish it. But when you have no heaviness and all that weight is abandoned, then you can go really, really high. And that's one of the reasons why when we're meditating, we try and let go as much as we possibly can. And then you're in that basket, there's the basket, you and the balloon, and you think there's nothing else to throw out. And then you realize that you can throw the basket off. You untie the basket, and there's you just hanging on to the balloon. And I always compare, compare that to letting go of your body when you're meditating. Let the body vanish and disappear. Because if you're as old as me, Oh, if you're very sick, you know the body is very 
can be compared very easily to a basket case. Uh, so that's the basket. And so once you're very, you let go of the basket, it's just you holding on to the balloon and you go so high, how can you allow that balloon to go all the way to Nibbana? You throw the other thing which is weighing it down, you. And when you disappear, that's when the balloon can go into these deep meditations. You have to disappear. And uh, the next way of letting go is uh, freedom from it. And that freedom uh, from it was well explained with that simile of the difference between a prison and a, say, a monastery. Any place you don't want to be is the prison. So when we do letting go, it doesn't matter where you are. If you want to be here, then it's an act of letting go. I want to be here. I don't mean that you're, you're attached to this place. It means you don't want to be anywhere else. You're here. That's the sense of freedom. And the last of these letting goes, the four ways of letting go, is the analia. And you may remember the word analia from its opposite, alia, and this, uh, the Himalayas. As you know, the Himalayas, Hima means snow in Pali or Sanskrit. And this is where the snows settle. Further to the east of India, there's a state called Meghalaya. Mega means the clouds. And this is the place where the clouds seem to hang around and stay for a long, long time. When I lived in London, London was known as Drizzle Aya, the place where drizzle settles. <laughs> However, that seems to be not the case anymore. But anyway, you understand the word alia is where things settle. And so here we make sure we don't allow anything to settle in our minds. You may have a bad meditation, so you think. But you don't think you're a bad meditator. You just experience a bad meditation. You let it go. You have a good meditation. You don't get proud or lazy. I know how to meditate now. I don't need to use any more wisdom to get still. You manage to make sure that nothing sticks to your mind, either success or failure. The simile of Buddhism is that of a, of a, a lotus flower. If someone urinates on a lotus flower or pours Chanel number no. five over a lotus flower, the lotus still smells like a lotus. No, no other liquids or smells stick to it. It all falls away. We also use that simile for praise and blame. Someone calls you the most amazing nun in the whole world, and then someone calls you the laziest nun in the whole world, and neither sticks to you. You know you're neither. So that's the way of letting go, the four ways of letting go. This is, again, the giving up, relinquishing of it, freedom from it, and never letting anything settle long enough to grow. And wherever in the world there is anything agreeable and pleasurable, there the cessation of wanting comes about. And what is there in this world that is agreeable and pleasurable? Sight in the world is agreeable and pleasurable. Hearing, smell, taste, touch, and knowing is agreeable and pleasurable. And there this wanting comes to be abandoned. There its cessation comes about. So even in the middle of the five sense pleasures, we can still restrain and say, I don't want anything. Whatever spiritual seekers in the past regarded pleasant and agreeable things in the world as impermanent, as suffering, as non-self, as an affliction, as fearful, they abandoned wanting seeing these things for what they truly are. And of course, then you don't want them anymore. Okay, so any questions on what I've said so far? Is it still too early for questions? Too early. Too early? Okay. Too early. Too early, okay. So I'll continue on. 
dependent cessation of all phenomena. Phenomena here is Dhamma. But with a remainderless, I love that word remainderless, fading away and cessation of that same wanting, this is my translation of Dunha. When I translated Dunha as craving, it seemed to be too intense a form of wanting. And other wantings didn't seem to fit in. So I changed the, the word to wanting. And it's much more accurate to how the Buddha meant it to be understood. With the cessation of that same wanting comes the cessation of fuel. This upadana. This upadana is often called attachment, and legitimately it also is used to mean fuel in Pali. And I prefer fuel because this is what is uh, driving and energizing, fueling this process of dependent origination, dependent cessation. So when the the fuel is cut off. With the cessation of fuel comes the cessation of states of existence, this bower. I know that some people sometimes call this becoming, but even grammatically that doesn't fit. That would be bower, a long A. And there are many examples of the Buddha of what bower means, like one of the ones which I quote was manusa bower, the state of existence of being a human being. These are the states of existence in which one can get reborn. With the cessation of the states of existence, there's a cessation of rebirth. It's jati, the cessation of rebirth, aging and death, sorrow and lamentation, pain, unhappiness, and distress cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. This is a passing away of suffering. The cessation, subsiding, and passing away of form, of experience, vedana, of perception, of will, of consciousnesses, is the cessation of suffering. The subsiding of affliction, the passing away of aging and death. And this is how the Buddha taught, it's a very accurate translation. The cessation, subsiding, and pass away of consciousnesses is a cessation of suffering. There's not some special form of consciousness which remains. It's when they cease. That's the cessation of suffering. And now we have something which sometimes confuses readers, but it's quite clearly explained and understood. There's two types of enlightenment, if you wish. There's Nibbāna with residue remaining, and it's Nibbāna with no residue remaining. Nibbāna with residue remaining. This is peaceful. This is sublime. That is the stilling of all will, all sankhara. And stilling means the samatha. It doesn't mean the concentrating of all will. It means the stilling of all will the relinquishing of all acquisitions, the destruction of wanting, fading away, cessation, nibbana. In other words, when a person does become arahat, when all these things start to disappear, it becomes very, very peaceful and sublime. They call it nibbana with residue remaining simply because the five candors are still there, the five components of existence. When Nibbana with no residue remaining, that's called Pari Nibbana. And Pari Nibbana means literally complete Nibbana with nothing remaining. So when excited by wanting, overcome by wanting, and full of aversion, overcome by aversion, when deluded and overcome by delusion, with mind obsessed by these, you intentionally create problems for yourself, for others, or for both, and you experience mental suffering and depression. 
but when wanting, aversion, and delusion are abandoned, you do not intentionally create any problems for yourself, for others, or for both. You do not experience mental suffering and depression. It is in this way, a very simple explanation, it is in this way that Nibbana can be experienced directly. Something has ceased your greed, hatred, and, diversion, and aversion. Okay. The destruction of delusion, this is called Nibbana, with residue remaining. A good example of that uh, is Siddhartha Gautama, under the Bodhi tree, wanting was destroyed, aversion finished, and delusion was uh, abandoned. And that's called Nibbana with residue remaining. And it was only at, um, where that was where the Buddha, between the sal trees, lay down and had parin Nirvana, which is a complete Nirvana, which is with nothing remaining. So, any questions yet? Yeah, a question here. Can you say something about something? Can you say something about wanting in terms of what we may consider wholesome wanting? For example, example wanting to help a charity. Yes. Uh, when wanting is coming from you, from a sense of self, that's a big definition of where wanting is going to cause a lot of suffering. Some people want to help a charity, but they're helping a charity for the wrong reasons. Either they want to control that charity, they're doing it just to show just how generous they are to their friends, or they're doing it for all sorts, or maybe just to lessen their burden of tax to the government so they help the charity. I know some people have told me this. You know, sometimes in the old days anyway, you could give a donation to a charity, and then as a result of that, you had to, you didn't have to pay so much tax. You actually made money out of, uh, you went in a lower tax level. You made, this is over in Australia, you made money by giving a donation to a charity. And sometimes people start their own charities. It really depends upon just why you are doing that. When the Buddha became fully enlightened, why did he start teaching? Why did he do anything? And this was when, uh, I think you all know this, it's part of the Buddhist understanding of the story of the Buddha's enlightenment, that this heavenly being, which was uh, Sahampati, Sometimes they call him Brahma Sahampati, but he was an anagami, a non-returner, residing in the Sudawasa, the pure abodes. And also, uh, Sahampati was also a monk under Kasapu the Buddha with Siddhartha Gautama, who in that previous life was called Jodipala. And so these were two old friends from a previous life. And uh, when Sahampati discovered that his friend from the previous life under Kasapa, the Buddha, was now a fully enlightened Buddha, I think it was from uh, Sahampati would have known that if no one prompted the new Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, the Siddhartha Gautama would have been silent for the rest of his life. It would have been what we call the Pacheka Buddhas. So Sahampati came to see the Buddha, congratulated on his, him on his full enlightenment, and said to him, there are beings with little dust in their eyes. Please teach them for the benefit and happiness of all beings. It was the will generated by Sahampati. And sometimes, because uh, I'm a cheeky monk, when we used to call Sahampati Brahma Sahampati, before I really knew that he was from the Sudawasa, because Brahma means like God. 
So it was called like God Sahan Pati. And so understanding that that was such an important cause of the Buddha actually teaching, on one of my talks I said, thank God for Buddhism. Thanks Sahan Pati for Buddhism. But of course, that was just messing around with words. So Hampati was the person who lit that little fuse to create the will, the wanting, noble wanting, so the Buddha could teach. And at the same time, because um, a venerable um, Chanda was sitting next to me, even Mara tried to convince the Buddha not to teach, saying it's very difficult to teach because some people give you a lot of trouble. Is that correct, Chanda? Yes. Yes. They give say, <laughs> yes. In order to give any teacher trouble, of course they do. That's part of the course. But the Buddha actually said, no, I will teach. I'll keep on teaching until there is a strong community of monks until there is a strong community of nuns, of bhikkhunis, until there's a strong community of white robed lay followers, men, a strong community of lay women followers. When all those four parts of Buddhism, we call the four pillars of Buddhism, when those four pillars of Buddhism are strong, then there's no need for me to teach anymore. It will be self-sustaining even without me. And that's what the Buddha did. And for so many years, almost 45 years, the Buddha taught. And then when Mara saw him under the Chapala shrine, Mara said, you've kept your promise. There are now so many enlightened monks and nuns, lay people, lay women. So, You've done your job. Now you can leave. And the Buddha said, in three months' time, I will give up my life faculty at Kusinara. The Buddha kept his words. And we often say that because that was the Buddha's, if you like, mission in life. That's what, if you might say, he wanted. And once it was complete, then the Buddha could enter Parinibbana. So the idea of when people say, oh, there's no uh, bhikkhunis in Buddhism, that was the Buddha's purpose of teaching. To have bhikkhunis, bhikkhus, lay men, lay women, the whole world, so those four pillars, nice and strong. Now we only have, well, we actually have got the fourth pillar again now, but still people don't encourage it enough. Anyway, from Paulina, many, many people who have never meditated before, who have been practicing the Dharma in daily life, become enlightened with metta. They can get to the first stage of enlightenment, which is entering the path to being a stream winner. But eventually, meditation is just the mind becomes very still and peaceful. And you get into these deep meditations. There's a formal way of doing it, you know, which is what we have been teaching here. But I've seen many people in my life who have just almost automatically, without even knowing what they're doing, I call it pressing the letting go button. And they get into these very deep states of meditation. One lady I remember, she wasn't even a Buddhist, but I saw her in Penang. And she was going to see psychologists and psychiatrists because she has some sort of experience which the psychologist, psychiatrist couldn't understand. And that really concerned her. When she talked to me, it was a very good meeting because when she told me what she'd experienced, I said, oh yeah, that was the first jhana experience. And I also mentioned a few other things which she, we, she would have experienced at that time. She said, yeah, yeah, you know what you're talking about. And so she left very happy because you know, once I could explain to her what it meant and what it was, that she was at peace with her experience. So why I talk like this? People actually achieved these things, not knowing what on earth they were. But they hadn't done any practice. I know somebody else who had never meditated, 
but managed to get into her first jhana when he was only six or seven years old. His name was Siddhartha Gautama. <laughs> Sometimes, for some reason or other, it could be past life experience or just a little bit of good fortune. As I say, pressing the letting go, go button, they can get in these deep meditations. But if you practice the Dharma in daily life, honestly, whether you like it or not, you will meditate. And sometimes you don't know what you are doing, but it is meditation. You have to have the full eightfold path to get enlightened. And actually, I mentioned that later on somewhere. Susie, oh, sorry, she's not supposed to say names. I feel like the happiness nibbana is an acquired taste. <laughs> I find myself deep down seeing excitement as happiness, not cessation. Is this common amongst practitioners, and how do they change this view? Thank you so much. Usually, as you get deeper and deeper into meditation, you get to know more and more types of happiness. And the next type of happiness you experience as you go deeper in these meditations becomes more delightful. You, it, It's not an acquired taste as much as uh, your sensibility of what happiness is and what happiness isn't becomes more refined. Look, I remember just a good example of this. When I was a young man, I liked rock music, things like Jimi Hendrix. Then later on in my life, I started preferring classical music. You know, and the things like my favorite composer, if anyone knows him, was Monte Verdi. And then later on, when I went to town and became a monk, it was you know, the sound of the, the rivers in the mountains or the wind in the trees became more delightful. And then later on, when I really got into my meditation, the sound of silence, I'm not talking about any weird sound, I mean, when all sound stopped, that became the most fascinating sound. Little by little, the, your experience of happiness becomes more and more refined. And the happiness is, which I knew as a young man, which is now seen as suffering. And the happiness of deep meditation becomes, you know, the much more preferable. And how do you change this view? Just experience. The experience teaches you what real happiness is. So as you meditate more and more, the peace and the stillness get stronger. And those are the ones which you like most. Dear Ajahn, through cessation of experience, perception, sense consciousness also happen with Nibbana. Yes, because what happens is uh, there's two things here that sometimes in very deep meditation, well, I'm talking here about the Arupa states. The Arupa states, the real Arupa states are always based on the fourth jhana, and as that uh, is maintained, it is still in that fourth jhana. Basically, the consciousness, the mind consciousness starts to disappear. Nothing is moving, it fades away, until eventually you have the cessation of perception and, and consciousness. And when that happens, that is called the uh, attainment, if you want for another word, it's not an attainment, the experience of cessation, you come out of that again, but the Buddha said that if you come out of that, you're either going to be fully enlightened or a non-returner. So it is an experience of Nibbana. Nibbana means things disappearing, flames going out. Sankara will disappear. I could understand that, but difficult to understand the disappearance of the other three with Nibbana, please kindly clarify, with Metta. It is difficult to understand, but as you get closer and closer to the disappearance, when you understand what they are, what is perception and, and consciousness, or what is will, when you understand what they are, you understand that they can disappear. And when they do disappear, it's very wonderful. I often use the simile of will being like the guard at a prison, never allowing you to be still. You think that will is yours, and so you don't want to get rid of it. It's like getting rid of an important part of yourself. 
when you see that how will causes you so much suffering, sometimes I can quite legitimately call it your enemy number one, but you think of it as your friend. When you actually see it for what it does, when the will vanishes for a short time, and then you feel so much freedom, so much release, it makes it feel really good. And the other disappears, the other three actually happens. To find, kindly clarify, if you were born in a prison, spent all your life in a prison, you're nothing else but prison, you're afraid of leaving that prison. You think that what could be outside, which is better than prison, this is your home, all you know. But then when somehow or other you leave prison temporarily and you realize what life outside is like, then you understand things like will and the sense experiences. It's not pleasant at all. You have something much deeper, more powerful to compare it with. And that's how you understand just the disappearance of these things as Nibbana is very pleasurable, very refined and wonderful. But of course, if you haven't gone out of prison yet, you're afraid of that world outside of prison. Did Kasapa the Buddha exist in our world or maybe previous eons? According to what most people said, it was in this world Kasapa the Buddha existed, basically uh, not that long ago. If Venerable Ananda did not persuade the Buddha to teach or ordain women, sorry? If Venerable Ananda did not persuade the Buddha to teach or ordain women, would Buddha have ordained women? I would say yes, certainly, because that was uh, his goal to begin with. Elvira says you don't need to answer her question. Okay. Anyway, I did. Sorry. Ajahn, is there a difference between letting go, letting be, or letting things flow? Thank you. Yes, it's what you let go of. Oops. What you let, what you let go of. It's anything which is doing, changing, controlling, curing. That's one one lets go of. And one one lets go of, letting be is what is left. You let it be. And you, are, you have this wonderful sense of gratitude for what you have. And you don't want any more. So what is here, you let be. Changing stuff, you let it go. Letting things flow. Of course, they flow automatically. So that's another way of saying uh, letting go. You don't try and direct the, the current. You take your hands off the steering wheel of your life and you're meditating. Okay. Thank you for all those questions. Now we'll go back to... Where is it? Um, yeah. Another one. Okay, yeah, the arahat. Oh, yeah. The arahat. If one is intent on the end of wanting and the clarity of mind, I like that phrase because if you want something, your clarity of mind it becomes distorted. You're not actually seeing where you are or what's happening. You are distorted by what you want and how to get it. When one sees the arising of any of the six senses, one's mind is, uh, if one is intent on the end of wanting and clarity of mind, when one sees the arising of any of the six senses, one mind is completely free from wanting. And I hopefully that you remember that guided meditation of imagining you are enlightened and arahat, you want nothing. There's nothing you need. Nothing deserves to be wanted. And then you feel this incredible state of freedom and peace. For one of a peaceful mind, one completely liberated, there's nothing further to be done. And no need to increase what has been done. It's all finished. As a stone mountain, one solid mass, is not stirred by the wind, so no sights, 
sounds, odors, tastes, touches or mind objects, desirable or undesirable, stir the stability of the mind. The mind is steady and free, and you witness the vanishing of the mind. When things are steady, then they disappear. This is that example I gave of going to Throstle Hole many years ago, just keep with my eyes open, just staring at a whitewashed wall in the meditation room. And after, a, I don't know, maybe half an hour, 20 minutes, the wall vanished. It told me something really important. That your senses can only notice things which change. And if they stay the same, then your experience of them disappears. Basically, the things vanish. The same happens with the mind. In deep meditation, you're so still, the mind turns off. That's the job of the Arupas. Now, as one who has considered all the contrasts on this earth, and is no more disturbed by anything whatever in the world, the peaceful one, freed from rage, from frustration and from wanting, the stream of consciousness will not be reborn. And this is, again, one of my favorite uh, suttas. This was an example of Mara asking this enlightened bhikkhuni, Vajira. Mara asks, by whom has this being been created? Where is the maker of this being? Where has this being arisen? Where does this being cease? Asking this enlightened bhikkhuni. And the bhikkhuni Arahat Vajira replies, Why do you now assume a being, Mara? Is that your wrong view? This is a heap of sankharas. Here no being is found. And here the sankharas are the will and what comes from the will. There's no being here found. Just as with the coming together of parts, the word vehicle is used, so when the five components of existence exist, there is this conventional term of being. It is only dukkha, suffering, that comes to be. Suffering that stands, and suffering, dukkha, that falls away. Nothing but dukkha comes to be, nothing but dukkha ceases. And that's in a couple of places in, this, in the suttas. And that's what I really amazed, so beautifully said. Sometimes we assume the idea of a being. We assume an idea of a self, an idea of me. And we do that because that's conditioned into us how everybody else looks at life. But as uh, a Buddhist, I hope you don't follow what other people tell you, certainly not me. Please see these things for yourself. Be rebellious. This all makes sense. And when you get into deep meditation, it's obvious to you. You can see it for so clearly. There's not a being here. It's just a heap of sankharas. And we use the conventional term Ayachanda or Ajahn Brahm or Derek or whoever, just like we use the word like uh, what is it, like a Volkswagen or a Toyota? It's just vehicles, that's all. But there's no essence of Toyota in there anywhere. There's only Dukkha that comes to be, Dukkha that stands, and Dukkha that falls away. Now, this is the last phrase, the last sutta from Samyutta 4853. And you know, please know this because I once asked Ajahn Bamali, in all your readings of the suttas, in which particular phrase does it say so clearly, elegantly, incontrovertibly, that there's nothing left after Parinibbana? And this is the quote from Samyutta 48, 
Sutta number 53. An arahat, enlightened one, understands that the six senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and the mind, will cease completely and totally without remainder, and no other senses will arise anywhere in any way. This is another way one knows that there is nothing more to be done. All those six senses cease completely and totally without remainder, and no other senses will arise anywhere in any way. And that's quite challenging for me to say that, because it goes against what most people would want. Sometimes it seems, I've just tried so hard, meditating, renouncing, keeping these precepts, just meditating hour after hour. It's unfair. All these other lazy, good for nothing, they don't do anything, and then they can enjoy their life next life. But when you understand there's only dukkha arising, dukkha existing and dukkha passing away, if you see it properly with wisdom, then it becomes a wonderful realization of the freedom from all suffering. It's going to end. Yay. When one realizes one is in prison and there is a way out, of course you take the way out. Right? That's it. Backside. 1920. Oh, the, the truth, the way the end is the cessation of suffering. Anyway, that should be a nice place to pause for some questions. Any questions? Yep. Dear Ajahn, is it true that you chose to meditate when other months were given time off to see family and travel? Even all know the same teachings. Please explain. Thank you. That was something which I did. I Basically, I deserve sabbatical. And so there was another monk with me at the time, and we talked about this. And he said, I'll take a sabbatical first. And when I get back, you can um, do a sabbatical. So off he went. And when he came back, he told me that he was going to be the abbot of uh, what banana chart. So I couldn't take my sabbatical. So that's a bit unfair. And so what we did, I said, well, look, you stay an extra six months here. And I'll just take a six-month sabbatical. And he asked me, where do you want to go? And I said, nowhere. I'm going to stay here in Bodhinyana Monastery in my cave and do a six-month silent retreat, which is what I did. So I never went off to see family or travel or anything. All I did was sit down in my hut in six months, and honestly, I never saw another human being for six months. They put food in my bowl, they left it in a box. I never seen them when they put it in. I took it out from the box. I never saw anybody. I ate the food, washed my bowl, and put it back in there for the next day. And that was it. For six months, a wonderful time. So I was wanted to meditate rather than go and see other people. So that was just what I did. I think that's what you meant. Okay, second question. When it says mind objects, does this mean thinking, fantasizing, etc.? No, mind objects means you know, the mind is a sense organ. It's what the sense sees or what it takes as its objects. You need the, uh, the sense, like mind, need something for the mind to know. And when those two come together, there's the experience of knowing. But when one of those is not there, there's no sense objects, there's no mind objects, of course the mind turns off. Becoming existence is therefore connected to change and to the objects of the mind. So it is when the mind is still that everything disappears. Yeah. The mind being really still. It's a difficult thing to be still because everything disappears. It's like you lose total control. 
They disappear by themselves. You don't tell them to disappear. You can't get them to re-arise again. You totally let things go. And when they go, they do go. Okay, that's all the questions. Okay, now we can go and start. I'm sure you can think of some more questions this evening to try and bamboozle me. Bamboozle is one of my favorite words. I don't know exactly where it comes from. It's got nothing to do with, with bamboo. The bamboozle is a beautiful word because it means you don't know on earth what's going on. It looks really difficult to understand. But anyway, here we go. The noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. The fourth noble truth. There are these two extremes. Oh, I love this stuff. There are these two extremes that should be avoided. The pursuit of happiness through the five senses, which is low, hina, secular, the way of worldlings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and a pursuit of practices that fatigue the body and mind, which is painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial. So this is the accurate translation here. Uh, when they say the pursuit of pleasure is always to do with the five senses, not the sixth sense of the mind. That is somehow include, excluded here. And the reason why it is excluded here, because the pursuit of the pleasure of the sixth senses leads to jhana, which leads to the power to liberate everything. And also the word hina jhana. Hina does not mean um, uh, like small vehicle. It means low, inferior, terrible. It's a very oppressive word, not oppressive, offensive <laughs> word. The word hina is an offensive word. So much so that many, many years ago when I had more time, I wrote to the Oxford English Dictionary here in Oxford and said you should not translate low, or shouldn't, sorry, you shouldn't uh, use the word hinayana because it is an offensive word. And I gave all the translations, both from Pali and from Sanskrit of the word hina. I also mentioned that Professor Richard Gombrich, who was a friend, he was here over at uh, Oxford University teaching Pali studies and Sanskrit studies. And I said, just go and ask him. And so this was to the Oxford English Dictionary. They uh, followed what I said, and they changed the word. Well, they didn't actually change it. and said Hinayana is an offensive term. It's, it's uh, low, Hina, secular, way of wordings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and the pursuit of practices that fatigue the body and mind. That's Atagilamatanu Yoga. And gila, gila, kila, sorry, is a word for tiring, for fatigue in it, which is painfully noble and beneficial. Without going to either of these extremes, the Buddha has awakened to the middle way, which gives rise to vision, which gives uh, vision, wisdom, leads to peace, to direct understanding, to enlightenment, to nibbana. Now, sometimes when I said about right view, sometimes we all think we've got right view. At least we think we're close enough. But does that right view give rise to peace, to direct understanding, which means that you understand from personal experience, not by belief in others, to enlightenment and nirvana? Does it lead to that? If it is leading to peace, this word upasama, which is like calmness, then follow it. As I said in that simile of overcoming doubt, it's like being in a mist in the mountains. Follow a stream because that will lead in the right direction and that will lead you underneath the mist. And you can see, yes, indeed, the path you are taking is leading to peace and to direct understanding for yourself rather than having to trust others. It is this noble eightfold path, right view, right motivation. You see, again, I retranslate these words because some of these words can be very 
um, taking in one in the wrong direction. It's not right intention, it's motivation, where you're coming from. You now coming from renunciation, kindness, and gentleness. Right speech, right action, right livelihood. And the next one, instead of right, uh, what do you do? Effort. Well, instead of right efforts, because when you get into these deep meditations, it's effortless, it's automatic. The word effort doesn't seem to fit. So in this translation, I said right endeavor. Even that seems to be not quite accurate. So usually it's like right renunciation because it's the same as um, when one renounces and restrains the sense basis. It's the same word here for right endeavor. Right mindfulness, which is a brilliant translation. And also, lastly, not right concentration, but right stillness. This is the middle way awakened to by the Buddha, which gives rise to vision, to wisdom, which leads to peace, direct understanding, to enlightenment, to nirvana. And now this is the one from the Arana Vibhanga Sutta. The pursuit of pleasure that is linked to the five senses is low, secular, coarse, ennoble, and unbeneficial. It's a state beset by suffering, frustration, despair, and fever. It is the wrong way. And just to be honest with you, the, the word I said here is coarse. That actually is a very, it is a coarse word, but the actual word means, means uh, the bad word for urine. So the Buddha was actually using a word which everybody understood. This is a pissy pleasure. And that was pretty accurate to what the Buddha said. Uh, pursuit of pleasure that is linked to the five senses is low, secular, pissy, ignoble, and unbeneficial. Sometimes being a monk, I'm not sure if I could say these words, but then you've got to be accurate to what the Buddha said. It is a state beset by suffering, frustration, despair, and fever. It is the wrong way. Disengagement from the pursuit of pleasure that is linked to the five senses Low, secular, coarse, ennoble, and unbeneficial is a state without suffering, frustration, despair, and fever. It is the right way. And now I state this. I just this is from the Dhammapada, verses two, it's usually two seven uh, three to two seven six. Because sometimes that uh, people would often say that we pass in the inside is the only way to enlightenment. This is what the Buddha said. The noble eightfold path is the best of all practices. This is the only path for purifying insight. There is no other. Ezo wa mago nati anyo dasanasa visudhiya. Even another party for this. This is the only path for purifying insight. There is no other. Follow this path and you will discombobulate Mara. I put that word discombobulate. It is a real English word. It does mean like confuse Mara. But I just you know, wanted to make things interesting for myself, because I knew I have to read this out many times. It means confuse them. Listen, the end of dying has been reached. I shall instruct you. I shall teach you the Dhamma, practicing as you are instructed by realizing for yourself in this very life through direct understanding, you will soon enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which people rightly go forth into monastic life. That's how the Buddha said it. And the thing to notice there, it did actually almost like a promise. I shall teach you the Dhamma. Practice as you are instructed, and you realize for yourself in this very life, through direct understanding, you will soon enter upon the abide in that supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which people go forth. 
if you follow the path, it works. If it's not working, you must not be following the path. There's some little error in there. It didn't say that you have to be a man. It didn't say that you have to be a human being. It didn't say you have to be intelligent. It didn't have to say that you have to uh, have any of these things which people say are high qualifications. And I've mentioned to you already in some of the stories that some people who had intellectual difficulties, learning difficulties, became enlightened. <laughs> Children became enlightened. And even there was one gentleman, he finally decided to ordain as a monk when he was 120 years of age. It's actually in his 120th year. And the Buddha ordained him. He soon became a stream winner. And then he became fully enlightened in his 120th year. We call that <laughs> cutting it fine. <laughs> but he did it. And those extreme examples give each one of you, you may think you're old or, you know, you're losing your faculties or something. Don't worry. 120-year-old people, sick people, people who could never get a place in school, people who were intellectually or uh, physically deformed, they managed to get enlightened. So why not you? Okay, the last question. So in our ordinary lives, ordinary, you're living an extraordinary life. You're actually listening to Dhamma this last week. That's extraordinary. That's amazing. So in our ordinary lives, should we remind ourselves that as much as possible, that each sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thought is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and non-self? Great. Why not? Thank you for the wonderful retreat and teachings. Excellent. So that's the Sutta class on the third and fourth noble truth. And uh, tomorrow we'll be expanding on the fourth noble truth, the right way to the cessation of uh, suffering. And that starts with you know, right view. Why do they call it right view? They call it right view because it's right to the goal of the cessation of suffering. The same with the other factors, right motivation, right speech, action, livelihood, and right uh, restraint, I think I'm preferring these days, right mindfulness and right stillness. So, Sadi. okay. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, thank you all for listening. See you later.